In some ways, we are tremendously lucky with regard to the accidents of history that left us archaeological evidence of ancient Near Eastern peoples. For many cultures, much less is known, much less survives. One great advantage for the preservation of the civilization was that in parts of the Near East, particularly in southern Mesopotamia, where many of the earliest cities were built, little stone or wood was available. The hot, dry climate of southern Mesopotamia did not allow for the growth of the types of tall, straight pine and cedar trees that were best for construction. Any such logs had to be imported. That was bad for the Mesopotamians, but good for us, because they used wood only where it was absolutely needed, in roofing and doors, for example, and found ways of being highly creative in their use of mud and clay. They built with it, made pots out of it, grew their crops in it, and wrote on it. Unlike wood, clay does not decompose. It also, fortunately, is not particularly recyclable. Whereas wooden logs or stone blocks could be reused in one building after another, a crumbling mud brick wall tended to get knocked over, leaving a foot or two of wall standing. The bricks leveled within what had been the room in order to create a new floor, and the floor then stamped down. New mud bricks were brought in to construct the walls of the new structure. And so, in much of the Near East, the ground level in villages and cities gradually rose as one generation after another built their homes on top of the leveled remains of older buildings. Rarely did anyone ever destroy those ancient levels. They were preserved simply by being ignored. Among the debris on the floors of forgotten buildings, Encased in mud beneath later levels, not just of homes, but of palaces, temples, government offices, workshops, and so on, was the trash that no one had cared enough about to save or remove. Broken pots were useless. They were strewn around many floors, along with food waste, old baskets and mats, and documents that were out of date, no longer relevant, and often broken. These included letters about issues long since resolved, Contracts for property purchased by parents or grandparents. School exercises. Lists of people who had worked together on forgotten projects. Loans already paid off. We have similar records in our own houses today. But because the people of the ancient Near East wrote on clay, many of the documents survived. Especially if the house burned down, fortuitously baking the clay. Much of the debris and detritus of daily life including such documents, were abandoned and buried as one level of construction was built on top of the one before it, over and over again. Hundreds of huge mounds, called tells, were thereby created over centuries or millennia, in which the lowest levels entomb materials from the earliest settlements, and the top levels hold debris from the most recent eras of occupation. Sometimes the site was never abandoned, and a city still thrives on top of and around the ancient Tell. The modern cities of Aleppo, Damascus, and Erbil, for example. Each has, at its heart, a Tell marking the original location of the city that has flourished there for thousands of years. Inside each undisturbed mound are all the stratigraphic remains of walls and floors and streets of past communities, every object and document in place, just where it was abandoned, unless disturbed by animals or by pits dug by later inhabitants. It might not be as perfect a time capsule as a city covered in volcanic ash, like Pompeii, but every tell is a storehouse of information, locked up hundreds or thousands of years ago. Excavators, when they take to working on such untouched tells, can ideally extract a great deal of knowledge about the ancient community while doing the minimum amount of damage. Study of the stratigraphy, the occupation layers below the present ground level of the site, allows archaeologists to place objects and buildings in time as well as in space. The information comes out very slowly. Modern excavations are often glacial in pace, as the archaeologists record every wall, every object, every ash layer, but little is missed. Using remote sensing, photography, and careful analysis of the organic remains, 
artifacts, and buildings as they are uncovered. Archaeologists and historians are able to rediscover vast amounts of information. This ranges from the contents of pots, which inform us about what people ate, to the ways that documents were organized in archives, to the uses to which rooms were put, to the layout of a whole neighborhood, which is occasionally possible without even uncovering it. Historians and epigraphists can read and analyze the documents found, sometimes identifying the names of the people who worked and lived in the buildings, learning about their concerns, their religious beliefs, their relationships with their neighbors, their marriages and children, and their work for the state or the temple. Whole communities spring back to life through the meticulous study of such details. Regrettably, though, we do not have this luxury for many of the ancient Near Eastern cities. Most are far from untouched. Some of the largest and most important tales have been ravaged for more than two centuries. First, by early archaeologists who knew no better, and later by treasure hunters and looters. Some of the digging crews blew through the sites like tornadoes, plowing through all the rooms and streets, palaces and temples, destroying walls and floors, throwing aside anything but the objects that were deemed museum-worthy or that could be sold for a profit, leaving a wasteland where once there had been a fragile time capsule. Looters still get to many sites before the archaeologists have a chance to excavate carefully, especially in Iraq and Syria, as a result of the wars there. Some sites are as cratered as the surface of the moon by the pits of the looters. The tragedy of all this is that nothing that has been destroyed in the course of digging or looting can ever be recovered. Much of the knowledge that could have been obtained from these ancient towns and cities is lost forever. Understanding the ancient Near East will always be vital to an overview of human history. No matter how many millennia stretch out ahead for civilization, its beginning, the first writing, the first cities, the first laws, and so on, will always lie in the Near East. What has been lost is lost not just to us but to all humankind in the future. The story of the origins of civilization will forever be less complete than it could have been had those sites been excavated methodically and not looted. Between the extremes of careful excavation and wanton looting are sites where, for various reasons, some vital information, though not all, has been lost to modern scholars. Some were excavated well, given the technology of the times. But the excavation took place before modern techniques developed. Some ancient cities were dug too fast, where the excavator hired hundreds of workmen, not allowing for adequate records to be kept of what was found. In some cases, mud brick walls were not recognized as such and were destroyed. Some sites have been sacrificed to the need for water and hydroelectric power, as dams have been built on the venerable rivers, and the reservoirs they created have drowned ancient cities. In such cases, rescue excavations have often been mounted to preserve as much as can be found over the course of a limited number of excavation seasons. But the majority of the material from such a tell ends up underwater. Not only has a great deal of information been lost to looters in early archaeology, but what is available to us now is only a fraction compared to what is still buried, awaiting discovery by future archaeologists, who will presumably have even better ways of preserving and extracting information from the physical evidence that they find. A history of the ancient Near East is therefore strangely dependent on what happens to have been recovered from the ground and on when and by whom it was recovered. Modern scholars follow along in the wake of early enthusiasts and thieves, piecing together a history from what they left behind, learning as much as possible from the objects, the tablets, and the excavation records, such as they are. These conclusions they combine with what has been deduced from modern excavations in order to come up with a portrait of the ancient Near East. The political history that results is sketchy, even for the kings and states about which we know the most, future historians will certainly be better informed about the ancient Near East than we are now.
The ancient Near East is defined here as comprising the cuneiform lands. That is, the regions of the ancient world where the cuneiform script, made up of short, wedge-topped lines combined into symbols, written mostly on clay tablets, was used as the most common medium for written communication. These lands were Mesopotamia, modern Iraq, with its variously named regions, Sumer, Akkad, Babylonia, and Assyria. Syria, Elam, part of what was later known as Persia, and Anatolia, modern Turkey. Although cuneiform was occasionally employed in both Canaan and Egypt, they had other writing systems that were more widely used, and they are discussed in this book only in the context of their trade and diplomatic relations with the cuneiform lands. The use of cuneiform is not an arbitrary distinction between ancient civilizations. The cuneiform lands had much more in common than simply the use of the same script. From the very beginning of urban civilization in the 4th millennium BCE, the lands of Mesopotamia, Syria, and Elam were in close contact with one another. Because the first southern Mesopotamian cities established colonies in the lands to their north and east. In later millennia, the peoples of these three regions were sometimes allies, sometimes enemies, and constant trading partners. Mesopotamia and Syria were occasionally united into a single empire, though Elam tended to remain outside such larger states. Anatolia was not a stranger to the cuneiform lands. Even in the third millennium BCE, in later centuries, Anatolian legends maintained that the great Akkadian king Sargon had ventured onto the Anatolian plateau during his campaigns in the 24th century BCE. The local people had a sophisticated urban culture, and they traded with the lands around them, including Mesopotamia and Syria. In the early 2nd millennium BCE, Anatolia joined the cuneiform world. The script was initially introduced by traders from Assyria and a few centuries later, it was adopted wholeheartedly by the local Hittite kings and their administrators. The Hittites assumed many of the cultural conventions of their southern neighbors, such as communicating through letters, establishing treaties with allies, maintaining palace and temple archives of administrative and religious documents, and ruling with the assistance of bureaucrats, governors, and vassal kings. Although the cuneiform lands shared many aspects of their culture, Geographically, they were distinct. The climate and physical landscape have not changed all that much since ancient times, so one can get a sense of the ancient places from exploring the regions as they are now. Southern Mesopotamia would be an uninhabitable desert were it not for the two rivers that weave across its flat expanse. The fast-flowing Tigris and somewhat slower Euphrates laid down the silt through which they flow. Lacking rocky riverbeds, the rivers have always been fickle, apt to change course completely after a flood. They now flow far from the ancient cities that used to depend on them. The Mesopotamian people tamed and domesticated the rivers, particularly the Euphrates, bringing its great force under control and using its waters for many of their needs. They irrigated their fields from it, sailed boats full of cargo and people on it, washed in it, drank it, though they preferred beer, fished in it, and used it as a moat for their cities. Although some catastrophic floods probably took place in the times of the very earliest settlements, perhaps destroying communities and burying them under feet of mud, and although vague memories of those floods influenced myths and legends, the Mesopotamians seem not to have suffered too much from flooding of the rivers after cities were established. Later letters, inscriptions, and prayers in which one might expect to see frequent references to flooding if it had been a major concern, mostly described the rivers as a blessing. After all, rain was scarce, but river water seemed to be an inexhaustible and reliable gift. Regions to the north, east, and west of southern Mesopotamia enjoyed more rainfall and depended less on rivers. In Syria to the northwest and Assyria to the northeast, the rivers mostly flowed through rock, and were less likely to change course. Farms did not need to be right next to the rivers. Watered by the rain, they could extend across the plains and into the hills, sometimes replacing the natural woodlands of pistachio and oak trees. In Anatolia to the north and parts of Elam to the east, 
mountains and plateaus made for land that was difficult to traverse, and, in places, to farm. Peoples living in the mountains were notoriously hard to rein into any large kingdom or empire. When powers in the plains began to weaken, it was often forces from the mountain that swept in to deliver the final blow to their dynasties. Many of the cuneiform lands were landlocked. Although the Mesopotamian cities in the far south had access to the Persian Gulf, and the port cities of western Syria faced the Mediterranean, most Mesopotamian and Syrian city-states and later kingdoms had no coastline. Anatolia was cut off from the Mediterranean Sea by the Taurus Mountains. Only the coastal plains known as Kizuatna, later Cilicia, to the southeast of Anatolia had useful harbors. So most of the communication among the cuneiform lands took place overland or by river. Natural resources were unevenly distributed as well. Southern Mesopotamia had the most dependable crops, and it had salt, along with bitumen used for waterproofing boats. But it had stone only in a few places, and no metal ores. It was not poor, however. Vast herds of sheep, which are mentioned in texts from all eras, produced abundant wool that was spun and woven into fine textiles. These were central to the Mesopotamian economy and were traded widely. Parts of Syria were forested, one area was known as the Cedar Mountain in Mesopotamian mythology. Anatolians had silver and copper ore in their mountains, along with obsidian. Elam was on the trade route that brought copper from central Iran, lapis lazuli, semi-precious blue stone, and tin from Afghanistan, carnelian, and shells from the Indus Valley, and perhaps gold from eastern Iran or Pakistan. Eventually, trade in these various commodities brought the lands into close contact with one another. For thousands of years before the first cities were constructed, people lived and prospered in Mesopotamia. Farming families who dwelled in small villages and towns in the north depended on the rainfall to water their crops, whereas in the south, farmers used river water. Across the region, Herders cared for flocks of sheep and goats. Men and women perfected the art of making fine pottery, textiles, and stone tools. With sun-dried bricks, they built rectangular houses for themselves and shrines for their gods, always on the same sacred spots. They buried their dead with goods that would be of use in the afterlife, such as pots and weapons, and with luxuries, such as seashells and gold from distant places. Gradually, communities became larger, as did the temples at their centers. Successful agricultural practices permitted more people to live together. The social and economic advantages of living with a few thousand other people, as well as perhaps the benefits of living near the gods in their temples, outweighed the disadvantages of living in close proximity to others, the noises, smells, and diseases. But these people had no way to record their thoughts or experiences. All knowledge was passed orally from one person and one generation to the next. So we know little about them. Only when the southern Mesopotamian communities expanded to become cities did someone come up with a system to capture all the facts needed to administer the communities. Facts that no one could conceivably commit to memory. And with this system, writing, Scribes gradually increased the types of information that they recorded, leaving a record for the future. The City of Uruk Uruk in 3100 BCE was vastly bigger than any community that had existed before, not just in Mesopotamia, but as far as we know, anywhere. It was enclosed by a city wall ten kilometers around and may have had a population of as many as 25,000. The goddess Inanna served as patron deity and queen of the city. Her house, or temple, the word for both was the same in ancient Mesopotamia, was Uruk's most important structure. As far as the residents were concerned, the gods themselves had constructed the earliest version of her temple on this sacred spot. Humans were a later addition to the city put there to serve her. Inanna, goddess of both war and love, 
was worshipped in other cities as well. But Uruk was her home. It remained so until the end of Mesopotamian civilization, thousands of years later, until Inanna had no more worshippers. A fragmentary tablet inscribed bearing a sequence of word signs was found in the remains of Inanna's temple in Uruk, one of a number that were found there. It was written around 3100 BCE, when writing was still a relatively new concept, and it provides an early glimpse into the economy and religion of the Mesopotamian people. It reads, 2. Temple, Sheep, God, Inanna. Or perhaps, 2. Sheep, God, Inanna, Temple. A scribe had impressed the signs on the clay tablet using a stylus, not for his own edification, but on behalf of the institution where he worked. Like most documents written in this early time, its meaning is hard to fathom. It is written in a script known as proto-cuneiform, a script that did not represent sounds or even language at all. Signs served as memory aids. At the top left of the tablet are two half ovals, each representing the number one. At the top right is a sign that stood for a temple or house. In the center, the circle with a cross through it signified sheep. Below that is a star. This either indicated the god of the heavens, An, or the idea of a god or goddess, and below that is a complicated sign for the goddess Inanna. One possible translation is, Two sheep delivered to the temple of the goddess Inanna. The temple to which the two sheep were to be delivered was presumably the one where the tablet was found, in a pile of rubbish brought in to level a floor, not in an archive. This structure was known later as the Ayana, literally the House of Heaven. The scale and complexity of the temple precinct would be impressive even for a modern structure. One can only wonder how extraordinary it must have seemed to a visitor in the 4th millennium BCE. At least seven large buildings, several of them separate temples, and a square courtyard 60 meters on each side dominated the walled complex. Most of the buildings were more than 50 meters, about 165 feet, long, each of them finely constructed of brick and limestone. One building had columns, the earliest known columns anywhere. But the builders seemed to have been unsure of this new technology, not certain that it could be trusted to hold up the roof. The columns were two meters wide, with little space between them. Some of the walls and columns dazzled the eye, covered with bright mosaics of red, white, and black circles set in patterns, herringbones, diamonds, and stripes. The colored circles of which they were constructed were the flat ends of cones pressed into plaster, some of them made of stone, others of clay. The investment of time and manpower devoted to the construction of this complex would have resembled the work on a medieval cathedral, as early as 3600 BCE, work had begun on the so-called limestone temple in the Ayana precinct. Quarrymen and masons removed limestone from a rocky outcrop around 50 kilometers, 31 miles, to the southwest. Other men transported the stone to Uruk. Still others formed hundreds of thousands of mud bricks and clay cones and set them out to harden in the sun. Others brought timber from far to the north for the roofs. Someone supervised all the workmen who set the bricks and stones and mosaic cones in place. The men would have been fed and provided for during the construction. The builders were all probably residents of Uruk, united in their desire to create a magnificent home for their beloved divine queen. Many economic documents from Uruk record rations presumably for such workmen and for countless others, men and women, employed by the temple after its construction. They received bread and beer, larger quantities for supervisors and smaller amounts for hired men, and smaller amounts still for women. Already society was stratified, 
with wealth and power unequally allocated. The rations were distributed in coarse, mold-made triangular bowls, referred to as beveled rim bowls, which are found in vast quantities at Uruk and at other sites from the same era. The sign for food, also for bread, in proto-cuneiform is the shape of a beveled rim bowl. But who brought the workers together to undertake the construction? Who ruled over them? Who organized their assignments and made sure they all got compensated? Who had all the beveled rim bowls made and filled with bread and beer? Did the people of Uruk have a king? Scholars think that they probably did not. At least not this early. There were no recognizable palaces, for one thing, and there seems to have been no word for king yet. An indication of this is seen in some of the earliest documents, which were simple lists of words and categories, perhaps to help scribes learn to write. One of these listed professions. The most important roles seem to have been listed first, but there was no king among them. The later terms for king were lugal or en. These terms don't appear on the list. It could be that priests were in charge. After all, they had the closest ties to the gods. The Goddess Inanna As for Inanna herself, she was housed safely in one of the temple structures. A lovely white marble sculpture of a woman's face was found in the early levels of the Ayana. This life-sized representation might even have been from Inanna's cult statue. Her hair, eyebrows, and eyes would have been inlaid with other materials, such as gold, bitumen, and lapis lazuli. Like all the gods and goddesses, each of whom had a city to call home, Inanna had a physical form, her cult statue, as well as a cosmic presence. The rest of her statue might have been made of gold, or of gold-plated wood, and would have been dressed in elaborate jewelry and robes. She was a fickle, sometimes imperious goddess, according to the stories about her written down by later scribes. Her priests would have wanted to keep her happy. One way to keep the gods and goddesses happy was to provide them with regular meals. The two sheep listed in the economic document might have been for this purpose. Just like humans, the gods enjoyed feasting. So meat, beer, bread, vegetables, and fruits were laid out for them several times a day. Proto-cuneiform writing and cylinder seals The fragmentary economic tablet recorded that these two sheep had some relationship to Inanna's temple, but it is not a particularly useful document to modern eyes. Even if it were complete, we know from other examples that there would have been no date. When were the sheep delivered? Were they indeed delivered? The text, like others of this era, has no verb. Could the sheep instead have been taken away from the temple? Who delivered the sheep? Was this a required tax or a voluntary donation? Or did the sheep belong to the temple? Who received the sheep? For bookkeeping purposes, the tablet seems inadequate. An archive of such documents would be untethered from the time, purpose, or individuals involved in their creation. This is true, unless perhaps such documents were placed in specific baskets or boxes that provided the additional information. For example, all the tablets in one box might have recorded sheep delivered on a particular day or from a particular herd. Other proto-cuneiform documents are often even harder to read than this one. Most seem to have listed nothing but numbers and nouns. The people of Uruk started out with at least 13 different numerical systems. They counted differently depending on what they were counting, and the signs indicated different numbers for different commodities. And about 30% of the signs they first created to represent nouns had no later equivalents, so scholars do not know how to read them. More than 5,000 proto-cuneiform tablets have been uncovered. The majority of them, like this one, from Uruk. Most of them, 85% in fact, are economic. 
The other 15% are lexical lists in which words were grouped in broad categories. In addition to the list of professions, there were lists of places, objects made of wood, body parts, and many others. But the scribes of Uruk did not write anything creative or reflective. They did not even write letters to one another. Those came later. Their writing system almost certainly had developed as a memory aid for officials charged with running a large organization. They needed to keep track of quantities of sheep, goats, textiles, foodstuffs, cattle, and the like. The temples seemed to have owned or controlled vast amounts of land and animals. A few earlier attempts at creating a system to help with the impossible task of remembering details about these properties had proved less satisfactory. Officials had tried making small tokens, one to represent each item, and putting them in a bowl, or sealing them in a clay ball, or impressing them on a piece of clay. They had varied the shapes of the tokens, one shape for a sheep, one for a pitcher of beer, one for a sheaf of wheat, and so on. But drawing signs on clay for each word and adding symbols for numerals seems to have worked much better. In fact, this economic text is far from being one of the earliest. The signs on it were impressed with a stylus with a straight edge, other than for the curve of the sheep sign. In the earliest documents, a century or so before this one, the signs looked more like pictures and were incised into the clay with a sharp, pointed stylus. Over time, economic documents became more complex and more informative, Scribes began to identify the persons involved in transactions, either by profession, the priest of Inanna, for example, or even by name. Names could be written somewhat phonetically, using pictures of objects that sounded like the name. The scribes added totals of goods distributed to different persons, and included the sum at the end. Some of the tablets listed place names. They can be recognized because the spelling did not change much over time often of Uruk itself, but also of surrounding cities such as Ur and distant cities like Kish, with which the people of Uruk were in contact. A few documents even mentioned the far-off land of Dilmun, way to the south across the Persian Gulf, in what is now Bahrain. In the later Uruk documents, there was still no logical order for the signs. They were not written in the sequence in which the words were spoken, the scribes do not seem to have thought of this script that they had invented as a representation of language. One other form of visual communication arose in Uruk at around the same time, the cylinder seal. It became the artifact that was perhaps the most characteristic of Mesopotamia, useful in many ways and also one of the most visually arresting objects produced by craftsmen in any era. A cylinder seal was a stone cylindrical bead carved in relief with a scene, so that when rolled on a piece of clay, it produced an endless tiny frieze of figures or patterns. Men and women of importance owned private cylinder seals and rolled them on clay documents to attest to their involvement in a transaction. Even more often they would use the cylinders to seal objects. A shipment needed to be secured against theft? plaster the top with a piece of clay and seal it. The recipient of the container would know whether the shipment had been broken into and who had sent it. Cylinder seals were used for thousands of years in Mesopotamia and Syria. The Uruk Period Uruk is the largest city that has been excavated from the late 4th millennium BCE in Mesopotamia. But a number of other settlements had the same type of monumental architecture, the same pottery, the same style of cylinder seals. Although each city was probably politically independent from the others, they shared a culture. It seems that their inhabitants spoke the same language, and they recognized the powers of one another's city gods. The documents they wrote show that at least some of them interacted peaceably with one another. Historians refer to their era from around 3500 to 2900 BCE as the Uruk period, the urban way of life in Uruk, with its huge buildings, high officials, social hierarchy, 
and temple-sponsored crafts workshops was almost incomparably more sophisticated than that of the villages and towns that came before. But the Uruk population had descended from those earlier peoples. The changes in technology and architecture were locally grown, not imported, and they were dramatic. Whereas earlier peoples had manufactured their pottery by hand, adding eye-catching designs and glazes, the Uruk craftsmen mostly produced pottery on the newly invented wheel, rarely adding any adornments. Quantity, now possibly with a type of mass production, seems to have taken priority over quality in ceramic manufacture. Metals were worked in much greater amounts than had been true before, with copper, sometimes worked with arsenic to add hardness, used for tools and weapons, and gold and silver for jewelry. The economic records show that the making of cloth was a large-scale enterprise, probably sponsored by the Temple of Inanna. To judge from images on cylinder seals, men were employed in herding and shearing, or plucking, the sheep, while women did the spinning and weaving, this was certainly true in later Mesopotamian history. Women's work was, in this way, always central to the economy. Surprisingly, Uruk-style buildings, pottery, and tools have also been excavated far from southern Mesopotamia, in Syria, Anatolia, and Iran. These telltale artifacts show that the people who created them had traveled, deliberately, from southern Mesopotamia in order to set up new colonies in distant lands. Some of the colonists went to existing towns and created their own neighborhoods there, living alongside the local people but leaving evidence of their presence in the objects they used and the buildings they constructed. Others perhaps attacked foreign towns and took them over violently, settling there and introducing new styles of objects and presumably new ideas languages, and organizations. A third group of colonists from the south found unoccupied lands, often at the intersection of a trade route and a river, at a place where it was easily crossed, and set up new cities in the virgin territory. These cities, such as Habuba Kabira in Syria, look a lot like Uruk. The people even use the same beveled rim bowls for rations. But with more evidence of urban planning. The areas the Uruk people colonized were not previously uncivilized. They had their own histories of development, with farming and towns and craftsmanship. Indeed, the very fact that these lands were growing more sophisticated might have drawn the Uruk colonists to them. The peoples there had access to goods that the southerners needed or wanted, such as metal ores, and flint for tools or timber for construction. One theory is that each of the colonies was formed by a different southern Mesopotamian city, each trying to outdo its neighbors in the acquisition of luxury goods and the control of trade. No matter the reason behind it, what has been referred to as the Uruk phenomenon or the urban revolution was like an explosion across the Near East brilliant thinkers, explorers, and inventors, whose names are completely unknown to us, built up a whole complex of interwoven technologies and institutions, including cities, government, writing, monumental architecture, the wheel, and bronze working, and set them rolling toward the future, which took them up avidly. The also unknown Leaders corralled their greatest resource, manpower, and organized it. Men built temples, dug canals, farmed fields, herded animals, and smelted metal ore. Women spun and wove cloth, and probably brewed beer and made pottery. They were all paid with some of the goods that the state or temple produced, beer, bread, and wool. Other men and women went off to distant lands and set up smaller versions of Uruk, certainly keeping in touch with home through messengers and presumably sending goods that could be useful to their mother cities. Other men learned to write in the proto-cuneiform script in order to keep track of at least some of this activity. 
Yet others develop the skills to carve intricate cylinder seals used by members of the elite to identify their goods. Was there any private economic activity in the Uruk period at all? If there was, it would not show up in the proto-cuneiform documents, which record only what was relevant to the temples. Were the priests authoritarian figures, remote and feared? Or were they more accessible, spiritual leaders, followed because of their connection to the gods? There is no way to know. Their names do not even appear in the written record. Not until a few centuries later, around 2900 BCE, did their successors build palaces and begin to rule as kings. One wonders also if the people of Uruk were aware of just how technologically and economically advanced their civilization was becoming. Were they aware of people in villages not so far away, or not so long before, who had experienced life so differently? Did they think of themselves as being on what we might call the cutting edge? Obviously they could not imagine that theirs was the first of countless cities to come could not foresee that the memory aid system they had invented would evolve into a writing system capable of recording any spoken word or thought. We think of this era as revolutionary. But did they? Around 2900 BCE, hereditary kingship developed in Mesopotamia as, to the minds of the people, the best way to administer a region and its population. Once kingship had been invented, not just here, but in many places and times around the world, this institution wrapped itself so securely and intimately around the concept of power and statehood that a state without a king was an anomaly, right up to very recent times. Kingship seemed so obvious and right to the Mesopotamians that they believed that it had been invented by the gods, that it had come down from heaven some later scribes made a grand list of all the kings from the beginning of time to their own era. They called it, When Kingship Came Down from Heaven, which was its first line. To modern scholars, it is the Sumerian king list. It was far from accurate, awarding early kings reigns that were tens of thousands of years long, rewriting history so that all of Mesopotamia was always ruled from one city at a time with various cities successively taking power from one another and forgetting some dynasties altogether. But for all its faults, the Sumerian king list shows how important kingship was to the Mesopotamians and how much they wished that their history had followed a regular pattern. The Mesopotamians were fond of order. It reassured them that the proper gods were in control of the universe. The gods wanted people to be ruled by kings. That was another message of the Sumerian king list. It was not just a convenient fiction invented by the kings themselves or by the scribes who created the list. It seems to have been a universally held belief. Even the gods themselves had a king, the great god Enlil, who lived in the city of Nippur. According to Mesopotamian belief, at some impossibly remote time in the past, before kingship had come down from heaven, the gods had lived on the earth and in the skies all by themselves. They did, however, need food, drink, and shelter, and Enlil, as king, needed these most of all. Lesser gods had therefore been forced to work in Enlil's fields, but they had grown tired of the backbreaking labor. They put down their tools and threatened to revolt. Someone else should be forced to do this work, they decided. So an enterprising god came up with the bright idea of creating humans. These would be god-shaped creatures, with the same faces, bodies, emotions, relationships, and language as the gods, who, of course, spoke the local language, Sumerian. But unlike the gods, they would be powerless and would die after just a short time on earth. Enlil and the other gods could insist that humans do their bidding, plant and plow their fields, make their food, build their shrines and decorate them with the most expensive and rare materials like gold and silver, weave fine clothes for them, pray to them, sing hymns to them, and the humans could never rebel. 
the gods held all the cards. This, at least, was what the Mesopotamians believed around a millennium after kingship developed, when the myth was written down. And it seems likely that it was already the common belief when kingship first developed, the era known as the early dynastic period. Perhaps it had even been believed during the Uruk period. Every human alive, the king included, was just a servant to the gods, and those gods could choose to treat him or her however they wanted. If the gods were well cared for, they might be merciful, even generous. Harvests could be plentiful, flocks could expand, people could be healthy, women could bear many children, men could be victorious in war. If the gods were angry, though, or just annoyed, they could do inconceivable damage. The realm of the gods closely resembled that of the humans, not just in having a king and in living in houses, their temples, and needing food and drink and company. They also married and had children. They quarreled and loved and lied. There was a hierarchy among them, with some gods serving others. None of them could claim to know everything or see everything or to be infinitely wise. Unlike humans, though, they did not die, and they had immense power. Among them, they ran the world, but any one of them had limits on his or her dominion. They needed one another, just as humans do. Order was maintained in the universe because the king of the gods possessed an object called the Tablet of Destinies, on which were inscribed the May. These May were never written down on any earthly tablet, as far as we know, for human edification but they encompassed all that kept chaos at bay. Humans were not significant enough, in the Mesopotamian view, to have any major role in cosmic events. It was neither here nor there to the gods what humans actually believed about them. They simply were. And just as the gods needed a king, so too did the humans. This was part of the cosmic order. Scholars are unsure of how hereditary kingship really developed. Perhaps powerful war leaders were able to convince their armies to keep them in power even when not at war. Perhaps a council of elders appointed a secular leader to balance the power of the priests. And just as professions tend to run in families, the king might have trained his son in the arts of leadership, grooming him for the throne. Who better for the gods to choose as a new king than someone who had spent his childhood at the side of the old king? The Sumerian term for king, Lugal, literally meant big man. The city-state of Lagash Mesopotamia was not unified during the early dynastic period. Each of the major cities was in the hands of a king who also controlled the area around the city, including farmland, villages, and sometimes lesser cities. Each of these city-states was home to a patron god or goddess who lived in the main temple. The people living in the city-states shared a belief in one another's gods. After all, these gods were related to one another. But that did not mean that the city-states always got along. Alliances could quickly disintegrate into animosities and armed confrontations. One city-state is particularly well known for this. This was Lagash, modern Al-Hibba in Iraq, home to the god Ningirsu and to a dynasty of kings who squabbled for generations with their counterparts in the neighboring city-state of Uma. A stone tablet engraved with the royal inscription of Enana Tum, one of the kings of Lagash, provides evidence of the way in which religion and kingship were inextricably entwined. The tablet was found by archaeologists in the foundation of the temple of Inanna in Lagash, called the Ibgal. This extensive complex was oval in shape, as were many early dynastic temples in other cities, with a large courtyard and a platform on which Inanna's temple was constructed. It was not at the center of the city. For some reason, Inanna's home was at the southwestern edge. The tablet was carefully enclosed in a box along with a copper statuette representing Inanna Tum's personal god, Shulutula. Votive gifts like this were crucial to the construction of a new temple. Several were found in the foundation of each structure, almost always with a stone tablet and a statuette together, always hidden away from view. <laughs>
The inscription begins with a dedication to the goddess, a list of the king's connections to the gods, and a genealogy relating him to former kings. For Inanna, goddess of all the lands, Inanna Tum, the king of the city-state of Lagash, the great governor for the god Ningirsu, the one given a good name by Inanna, the son of Akurgal, the king of Lagash, the beloved brother of Eanatum, the king of Lagash. It continues describing the construction of the Ibgal, the very temple in which the inscription was found. For Inanna he constructed the temple oval Ibgal. For her he made the temple precinct, Eanna, better than any other in all the lands. He furnished it with gold and silver. The inscription ends by giving the reason for its having been written and placed with the statuette of Inanatum's personal god. He put this in place so that his god Shulutula might pray forever to Inanna in the Ibgal for the well-being of Inanatum, the one with whom Inanna communicates, the king of Lagash. The king who keeps it permanently in good condition will be my friend. This inscription includes a great deal more information than did the earlier economic documents from Uruk. The scribe who wrote it around 2450 BCE was using the script, now cuneiform rather than proto-cuneiform, in a very different way from the official who recorded that two sheep had, perhaps, been delivered to the temple of Inanna in Uruk. This later scribe wrote not to keep track of commodities, but to express complex thoughts and to commemorate the king's piety and devotion, as reflected in his construction of the goddess's temple. Early Dynastic Cuneiform Writing The scribe was no longer limited to using symbols only for nouns and numbers. The script had developed into an elegant means of expressing all kinds of ideas. It featured a combination of types of signs, some of which still stood for whole words, some for phonetic sounds, and some for so-called determinatives, signs that were not read aloud but that helped the reader know which category a word fell into, such as a symbol used for wooden objects or one that indicated God's names or one for city names. An unintended outcome of this greater complexity is that scholars can identify the language behind the script as Sumerian. This was an impossibility for texts from the Uruk period. The scribes did not, however, try to express every part of speech. Their script was still a shorthand version of language. Sometimes they would choose to conjugate a verb appropriately. Often, they would not. To add to the complications of reading texts from this era, Sumerian was not the only language spoken in southern Mesopotamia, the region known as Sumer. Akkadian, the Semitic language of central Mesopotamia, showed up in subtle ways as well. Some words in Sumerian had been borrowed from Akkadian. Some scribes had Akkadian names even though they wrote in Sumerian, which suggests that they were bilingual. In the early dynastic period, writing was not yet being used for many of what we would think of as its obvious purposes. It was still fundamentally utilitarian. The kings had, however, begun to realize its potential for extending communication in an almost magical way beyond what could be accomplished with the spoken word. Writing could perpetually and eternally address an audience on a king's behalf. The words were always there, even when the king was not thinking about them. Given that the population was almost entirely illiterate, such an audience was mostly made up of gods. The statuette of the king's personal god, or sometimes of the king himself, inscribed with the same text as the tablet, could therefore pray continuously, in a way that a real person could not. Just as the statue of Inanatum's personal god in the foundation deposit was described as praying constantly to the much more powerful Inanna, writing could also address an audience even after its author had died, an audience of those as yet unborn kings who might uncover the tablet and statuette when remodeling or rebuilding the temple at some distant future time. As Inanna Tum noted, the king who keeps it permanently in good condition will be my friend. Although many of the writings by early dynastic kings were created for the dedication of temples to the gods, some recounted the king's other great deeds, 
such as victories in battle, organized military forces having been one of the products of the urban revolution. These victories, too, were usually credited to the gods, by whom the king had been chosen in the heart and given a good name. Such inscriptions also, like the foundation text by Inanatum, almost always listed the name of the king's predecessor, his father or brother who had served as king before him. He truly had a right to the throne, he asserted, having been selected by the gods and born into the royal line. Some aspects of the culture had changed little since the end of the Uruk period, 600 years before. The inscription shows that Inanna still needed temples and that she required offerings. King Inanna Tum gave her more than just food and drink. He claimed that he furnished her temple with expensive and showy gold and silver. And the king also interceded with the gods for his people. As Inanna Tum put it, he was the one with whom Inanna communicates. He hoped, in exchange, that she would provide for his well-being. Theirs was a complex and interdependent relationship. The same might have been true of the earlier priests of Uruk, but they had not yet developed a writing system that could have expressed such longings. Temple and Palace Estates The major early dynastic temples, such as that of Inanna, all owned extensive estates, fields, orchards, herds of animals, workshops, as did the palaces. It was not only the king who had a royal palace. In the kingdom of Lagash, so did the queen. In fact, all of the 1700 administrative tablets that were found at the later capital of Lagash, called Girsu, came from the queen's palace. The queen personally administered its estate. Excavators have not found the king's palace. Not far from the Ibgal temple of Inanna, where the dedicatory tablet was found. Archaeologists excavated the earliest known brewery anywhere in Mesopotamia. A tablet found there even mentioned the brewer. Its main oven, five meters across, completely filled a large room. Another court housed a large tank and several ovens. The temple must have produced tremendous quantities of beer, not just for the god himself, but also presumably for the rations of his many servants and workers. Barley beer was the staple drink of all Mesopotamians, being both nutritious and less germ-filled than river water. The various palaces and temples probably produced similarly vast quantities of food and textiles. Writing continued to be essential to keep track of it all. Many, perhaps most, of the inhabitants of each city-state presumably worked for a temple or palace as farmers, herdsmen, or artisans of various kinds. Battles between Uma and Lagash A series of texts from Lagash records a continuous struggle with the neighboring kingdom of Uma to the west. The two states fought for generations over a broad swath of land that separated them. Some of the inscriptions included surprising amounts of detail. Enanatum's brother and predecessor, the similarly named King Eyanatum, described an injury that he received in battle and the pain it caused him. A person shot an arrow at Ayanatum. He was shot through by the arrow and had difficult moving. He cried out in the face of it. Some of these documents about the conflict were written on stone monuments, which perhaps were placed as physical markers right on the border between the two kingdoms. Again, the kings sometimes wrote to future kings in these inscriptions, attempting to control their actions. They worried that their successor might obliterate the good works they had achieved. One king wrote about and on such a monument. If another leader destroys it there, or takes it away and makes off with it, may his city, like a place infested with harmful snakes, not allow him to hold his head erect. May poisonous fangs bite that ruler in his ruined palace. At around the same time, they invented inscriptions by which to communicate with gods and with future kings. The king's scribes began to use writing for addressing those at a different kind of distance from themselves, kings of other lands. The first letters ever written seem to have been sent from one king to another, carried by messengers. Sometimes the letters bore peaceful tidings and were accompanied by gifts. At other times, a letter could remind its recipient of past alliances or animosities. 
Some letters might even have threatened war. One king of Lagash sent a fierce message to Uma. Be it known that your city will be completely destroyed. Surrender. Be it known that Uma will be completely destroyed. The original does not survive. It was quoted in an inscription. It is interesting to note from this that messengers traveled to Uma even when relations between the two kingdoms were obviously extremely hostile. Note also that the king of Lagash felt the necessity of warning the king of Uma that he would be attacked. Earlier messengers had certainly recited communications from memory, but a written letter could serve both as a memory aid to the messenger and as a concrete evidence of the sender's intentions when checked by the recipient's scribe. People living in the cities of Girsu and Lagash or in the many villages within the kingdom did not necessarily think of themselves as Sumerian, even though Sumerian culture was fairly uniform across southern Mesopotamia. Their allegiance was to their city-state. This was reinforced by their frequent wars with their neighbors. Lagash and Uma were, in turn, surrounded by a number of other city-state kingdoms, including Uruk and Ur to the south, some of which were friendly, others hostile. To the north of Sumer, a much larger kingdom, Kish, dominated the region later known as Akkad. The king of Kish even sometimes enforced order in Sumer. For example, Inanatum's son and Metena wrote that the border between Lagash and Umma had been determined by the great god Enlil himself and had been confirmed by the king of Kish. Mesalim, king of Kish, at the command of the god Ishtaran, measured the field and set up a boundary stone there. The authority of the king of Kish was therefore acknowledged, at least temporarily, by both the king of Umma and the king of Lagash. Sometimes, Sumerian kings managed to conquer other cities, inspiring them to assert that they too could take the title King of Kish, though it is unlikely that they actually controlled Kish itself. Eyanatum of Lagash, the brother of Inanatum, claimed this title. So did a king of Uruk, who conquered neighboring Ur, and then signed to a treaty of brotherhood, alliance, with King Enmetena of Lagash. This was not the first time that Ur had been conquered. Earlier documents record its defeat by Lagash. One might conclude from this that Ur was a weak, minor kingdom at this time. In fact, the opposite seems to have been true. The Royal Tombs of Ur Although not much of the early dynastic city of Ur has been excavated, in the 1920s archaeologists uncovered there a huge cemetery of about 2,000 graves. Many of these contained the bodies of wealthy citizens, and sixteen of them captured the imagination not only of the excavator, Sir Leonard Woolley, but of people around the world. Each of the sixteen graves included a subterranean tomb building, surrounded by a burial pit. The tomb housed the body of an elite man or woman, along with innumerable objects for his or her afterlife. Metal bowls, musical instruments, jewelry, sculptures, weapons, furniture, food, even cosmetics. Were they all kings and queens? Woolley thought so. More recent scholars are not so sure. Perhaps some of them were priests and priestesses. In any event, they were people of immense wealth. Many of the luxurious objects buried with them were of gold, silver, copper, and semi-precious stones, none of which could be found natively anywhere near Ur. The raw materials had been imported by the leaders of Ur from as far away as the Indus Valley and Afghanistan. Over months and years, these materials had been worked into exquisite objects by highly skilled craftsmen, only to be buried for the continued use of the leader in the afterlife. Even today, the objects from the so-called royal tombs attract huge crowds when exhibited in museums. Another aspect of the royal tombs was more disturbing. Woolley himself described one tomb. The pit was roughly rectangular, and was approached, as usual, by a sloped ramp. In it lay the bodies of six men servants and sixty-eight women. The men lay along the side by the door. The bodies of the women were disposed in regular rows across the floor, everyone lying on her side, with legs slightly bent and hands brought up near the face, so close together that the heads of those in one row rested on the legs of those in the row above. 
These were not the bodies of kings or queens, but of men and women who had been sacrificed in order to be buried with their lord or lady. Woolley believed they had died without a struggle, perhaps poisoned. But recent studies of a few skulls show that at least some of the attendants were killed by a blow to the head. Were the attendants terrorized into submission, or did they agree willingly to end their lives this way? The women were dressed in finery to match their dead mistress, with red coats and beaded cuffs and shell-ring belts, headdresses of gold or silver, great lunate earrings and multiple necklaces of blue and gold. Presumably, the attendants and the wealth were interred so as to be available in the afterlife to the leaders who had died. Surprisingly, though, the Mesopotamians rarely wrote about the afterlife. Literary descriptions suggest that the netherworld was a gloomy place, dark, with bad food, and no way out. And there was little about it that suggested either a reward or punishment. It simply existed. And yet, since these kings, and many commoners whose burials also contained gifts and food, took their worldly possessions with them, perhaps they believed they could improve their lot in the afterlife. The early dynastic kings would not have viewed their kingdoms as small. They had no way of knowing that larger kingdoms were soon to come. Each of them, whether he ruled in Ur, Uruk, Lagash, Uma, or any of the other states, would have been self-important and perhaps somewhat terrifying to his people. He had the support of the gods. He could command soldiers to fight for him and attendants to die with him. He killed enemies and enforced obedience. Many of his subjects worked in the textile workshops, breweries, kitchens, fields, and orchards of his palace. But in return, he provided for them. A favorite image that kings chose for themselves in statues from the early dynastic period shows the monarch with a basket of earth for construction on his head. He might be a mighty ruler, but he was also a builder, erecting monuments to his gods and taking care of his people. In the mid-24th century BCE, a new type of state emerged in Mesopotamia, one that incorporated dozens of former kingdoms. Whereas earlier kings had managed to bring at most a few city-states together through conquest or treaty, an upstart leader named Sargon was able to conquer almost all of what is now Iraq, along with much of Syria. He forged the world's first empire, Sargon probably began life as a commoner, overthrew the king of Kish, and became, in his own immodest words, one to whom Enlil has given no rival. To him, he, Enlil, gave the upper and lower sea, the Mediterranean and Persian Gulf. These words come from an inscription that Sargon commissioned to commemorate his victories. Although the original version of it is lost, the words are still preserved. This is because not long after Sargon's time, a meticulous scribe made a copy of all the royal inscriptions to be found in the main temple to Enlil, in the city of Nippur. He wrote them all out on a large clay tablet and included Sargon's words among them. The scribe's version was then copied again centuries later. The Mesopotamians had a fascination with the past and a surprisingly sophisticated understanding of the value of copying ancient documents accurately and preserving them for the future. Sargon's campaigns were almost certainly relentless and brutal. He attacked Uruk, which had been the site nine centuries before of the elaborate temple to Inanna with its dazzling mosaic walls. He claimed that he vanquished Uruk in battle and smote fifty governors and the city. Then he had turned to Ur, home to the fabulously rich leaders who had taken dozens of attendants with them to their deaths. Again he vanquished Ur in battle and smote the city and destroyed its fortress. One city after another fell to his armies, Lagash and Umma among them. These former enemies now paid their taxes and tribute to the same overlord. Having reached the Persian Gulf with no further Sumerian cities to conquer, Sargon, with great symbolism, washed his weapons in the sea. In addition to his southern conquests, Sargon marched north and conquered perhaps as far as the Mediterranean. Across the empire he demoted local rulers, 
and placed Akkadian-speaking officials in charge, transforming the traditional city-state structure that had developed over centuries. Akkadian, Sargon's native tongue, was the Semitic language spoken in central Mesopotamia. Rebellions repeatedly broke out, not just during his reign, but in those of his successors as well. But Sargon hung on tenaciously to his empire. After repeated victories, Sargon's attention turned back towards his home. He wrote that he restored the territory of Kish. Kish had dominated the region of Akkad for centuries, and it was perhaps Sargon's original home. So he was keen to build it up and to restore and remodel it, rather than to destroy its walls as he had in southern cities. But he did not set up his capital there. Instead, he built a new city, called Akkad, or Agade, which gained a reputation for immense wealth and luxury. Regrettably, archaeologists have not yet identified which of the ancient sites was the location of Akkad, though it probably lay to the east of Kish on the Tigris River. Its palaces and temples, houses and archives await discovery by future generations of scholars. Besides a few copies of inscriptions, not much is therefore preserved from Sargon's own time. The few contemporary documents that survive suggest that Sargon wanted to portray himself as, and indeed to be, something quite different from the kings who came before him. He did not initially use the traditional title, King of Kish, that previous kings had aspired to. Not that he did not rule Kish. He did, and he could have used the title without exaggeration. But he chose to be King of Akkad instead. Sargon also seems to have taken land away from some of the temples in order to control it himself, and to have allowed some of it to be acquired by private individuals. Such land could be bought and sold, which might have been an innovation. He also called upon a group of 5,400 men and put them into roles that gave them a special relationship to him. He noted that he fed them daily. They were almost certainly some sort of elite military force supported from the wealth of the king's estates. In one of his inscriptions, Sargon boasted of close ties that he had forged with distant lands, Dilmun, Bahrain, Magan, Oman, and Meluha, the Indus Valley. He claimed that boats from these lands came all the way to Akkad with their wares. Archaeological finds confirm that the Mesopotamians were indeed in contact with those regions at this time. Luxury goods made of carnelian, diorite, copper, and lapis lazuli have been excavated from Akkadian levels at Mesopotamian sites. These materials would have arrived on the foreign boats. More than any previous king, Sargon seems to have focused his attention outward from his local area onto distant places, using conquest, trade, and diplomacy to put his stamp on the world of his time. At least with his empire, this meant that resources from great distances were funneled into Akkad, to the benefit of the capital and the detriment of the conquered lands. All of this extraction of wealth must have infuriated his vanquished subjects. One would think that they would have told their children and grandchildren stories of their oppression and of the cruelty and villainy of Sargon. But those were not the stories that survived. Sargon was certainly remembered, but not as a brutal tyrant, Ultimately, he was viewed as a hero. Over time, his life story gained mythical touches. He was born in secret. He miraculously survived being cast off down a river in a basket. He was loved by the goddess Ishtar, the Akkadian name for Inanna, and so on. He was a life to idolize and, for kings, to emulate. More than 1,500 years after his death, the stories of Sargon's deeds continued to be told. Enheduanna, Priestess of the Moon God One reason for Sargon's propaganda success, perhaps, was his use of religion to legitimize his reign. Not only did he claim that the gods gave him his empire, just as the earlier Sumerian kings had claimed that their local gods chose them for kingship, he also placed his daughter in one of the highest religious positions in all of Mesopotamia. 
she became the high priestess of the moon god Nana in the city of Ur, where the god had his chief residence. No doubt the kings and queens, or priests and priestesses who had been buried in the sumptuous tombs in the early dynastic period, and who lay just meters away from Nana's temple, had also been devoted to the moon god. The daughter's name was Enheduanna. She might have been given this Sumerian name at the time of her appointment. Her native tongue, like that of her father, was Akkadian. In placing Enheduanna in an eminent position in Ur, Sargon perhaps hoped to convince the people there that he had their interests in mind. He probably also benefited from the appointment in that Enheduanna took control of the immense estate associated with Nana's temple, and with it, a good part of the economy of Ur. His motives, however, would not only have been political and economic. Although Sargon's dynasty was dedicated to Inanna, or Ishtar, he also wanted the support of the moon god Nana, also known as Ashim Babar. Enheduanna had some of the same responsibilities as a governor. She represented the king in a conquered city, and she administered extensive lands and a large workforce. But as priestess, she also played a religious role, and in that role she composed hymns to the gods. I, Enheduanna, the En priestess, entered my holy Gipar, palace. In your service, I carried the ritual basket and intoned the song of joy. The woman, Inanna. Foreign lands and floodlands lie at her feet. The woman, Inanna, too, is exalted and can make cities tremble. I, Enheduanna, will recite a prayer to you. To you, holy Inanna. I shall give free vent to my tears like sweet beer. Do not be anxious about Ashim Babar. These words come from a hymn of 153 lines, as in the royal inscription written by Inanna Tomb of Lagash 150 years before. The goddess Inanna takes center stage. Like Inanna Tomb, Enheduanna describes bringing gifts to the goddess, the ritual basket and a prayer. But, unlike in a royal inscription, Enheduanna did not put the emphasis on herself and her deeds. Instead, it was the goddess who was exalted. Enheduanna wrote two other hymns as well. Like this one, they are beautifully composed, full of emotion and vivid imagery. They are sometimes referred to as the first literary works for which we know the author. And therefore... And Heduana herself gets named as the first author in the world to take credit for a composition. But it is a subtle distinction. As far as we know, and Heduana did not suddenly come up with the idea of authorship. She might well have included her name for the same reasons that a king named himself in a royal inscription, and there were plenty of precedents for that. And Heduana was familiar with hymns because of her religious role and she was familiar with royal inscriptions because Sargon, her father, was the king. Our modern definition of the hymn as literature, in contrast to a royal inscription as propaganda, would probably have been lost on her. The most surprising aspect of the hymn, which she wrote with such passion, is that she was the high priestess of Nana, or Ashimbabar, not of Inanna, although it was the latter to whom she addressed her words. And Heduana here was following her father's lead. Sargon's devotion to Inanna or Ishtar is evident in his inscription. Ishtar was the first deity that he mentioned, with Sargon named as the overseer who worked on her behalf. Sargon, king of Akkad, overseer of Ishtar, king of Kish, anointed priest of the god Anu, king of the country, great Ensi of Enlil. These other gods, Anu and Enlil, were important to include because Anu was seen as the original father of the gods, and Enlil, Anu's son, was the king of the gods and had been traditionally the god most connected with earthly kings. Sargon claimed to have the support of all three. His successes were their successes,
and Heduana recognized her joint, and perhaps conflicting, loyalties to Nana and Inanna and her hymn. Do not be anxious about Ashimbabar, she wrote to the goddess. And Heduana alluded vaguely to a crisis in Ur, her adopted home. She wrote in another part of the hymn that, My Nana has paid no heed to me. He has destroyed me utterly. Some scholars think that perhaps the disaster she suffered was shared by all of the people of Ur, and that the city had been attacked by Uruk. Or perhaps her crisis was more personal. And Heduana expected the moon god, to whom she was formally dedicated, to have saved her. But he did not. It seems that she was even denied her position as priestess and was sent into exile. He, Nana, stood there in triumph and drove me out of the temple. He made me fly like a swallow from the window. He stripped me of the rightful crown of the N priestess. Her appeal to Inanna was the desperate move of a woman who felt that her god had abandoned her. Hence the acts mentioned in the hymn, the greetings, gifts, prayers, songs, and tears to Inanna, along with the hymn itself. An ancient editorial comment at the end of the hymn notes that it had its desired effect. The powerful lady, Inanna, has accepted her offerings from her. Inanna's holy heart has been assuaged. The City-State of Ebla The northern kingdoms that Sargon had conquered were larger than their Sumerian counterparts. He boasted of having been given the Syrian lands of Mari and Ebla by their local god. When archaeologists identified the sites that were home to these ancient cities, Mari was on the Euphrates at Tel Hariri, Ebla farther north and west at Tel Mardich. They found evidence of impressive early dynastic communities surrounded by extensive kingdoms. The discoveries of these Syrian kingdoms came long after the excavations of the Sumerian city-states. Historians and archaeologists had concluded that civilization had developed in Sumer and that surrounding areas were less advanced, so cities like Ebla and Mari were initially thought by many to have been peripheral and dependent for their inspiration on the south. In recent years, though, scholars have seen the northern kingdoms as having made important contributions of their own. The kings of Ebla and Mari squabbled and reconciled, drew up peace treaties and broke them, just like the southern kings of the early dynastic period. They may in fact have been more sophisticated in diplomatic affairs than were their southern counterparts. Although none of the royal inscriptions from Ebla and Mari survive for this period, administrative documents recording goods going in and out of the palace show that men known as stewards were in charge of diplomatic contacts between the two kingdoms. Traveling from one city to the other took the stewards about two weeks, and they made the journey repeatedly. They carried with them gifts from Mari to Ebla, often in the form of lapis lazuli, and from Ebla to Mari, often silver. The stewards also received personal gifts of silver from the courts they visited. Other stewards traveled even farther. A letter survives from Ebla that was addressed to an ambassador from Hamazi, a city probably in northern Mesopotamia. The two powers exchanged valuable gifts and letters. Kings of Ebla also arranged marriages for their daughters to distant kings. Economic records show that staggering amounts of silver and gold changed hands between Ebla and Mari. In fact, given that Ebla is located nowhere near a gold mine, and that it was a kingdom of only about 200,000 people, the amount of gold in use there is almost unbelievable. One administrative text accounts for the gold used in the manufacture of an enormous jar. Total, 838.20 minas of gold for one jar with a listing of the amounts of gold used in different parts of the jar, including its base, stand, shoulder, and lip. The equivalent of 838 minas is 394 kilograms, 869 pounds of gold. At a recent rate of $1,500 per ounce, such a jar would be worth almost $20.1 million if made today.
A number of such ceremonial jars were made, in varying sizes. None of them has been found, of course. They would have been melted down long ago. Perhaps even by Sargon, when he brought Ebla into his empire. The riches found in the royal tombs of Ur would have been small change in comparison. The records of the gold jars, and of all other parts of the Ebla economy, were written on clay tablets in the cuneiform script, as in Sumer. The scribes of Ebla used the Sumerian language for some of their texts, clearly having been taught the script originally by southern teachers. But they also used cuneiform in order to write in their native Semitic language, known as Eblaite. Thousands of the tablets, beautifully laid out and elegantly written, were recovered from an archive room in the palace where they had been carefully stored on shelves. The surfaces of the large tablets were divided into hundreds of rectangles in what almost looks like a checkerboard pattern. Each rectangular section contained a number of cuneiform signs representing a word or a phrase. The scribes wrote these sections in columns to be read from top to bottom of the tablet. Although most of the tablets recorded details of the administration of the kingdom, some of them were used by scribes in the course of their education or as reference works. Lists of words in Sumerian, just like the ones that had been used as long ago as the Uruk period. Some of the lists gave the Eblaite equivalents of Sumerian terms. These were helpful not just to Eblaite speaking scribes, but to modern scholars deciphering the ancient languages. Akkadian Innovations Sargon's grandson, King Naram Sin, also claimed to have conquered Ebla and even said that he was the first to do so. Perhaps this was hyperbole. The kingdom might have rebelled after Sargon's death and achieved some independence, only to be brought back under Akkadian rule. Or perhaps the city had capitulated to Sargon without a fight when he conquered Mari, so that Naram Sin's conquest was indeed a first. Naram Sin was so convinced of his own exalted status that he had himself deified, or, according to legend, acquiesced when his people chose to make him a god. He was one of the very few Mesopotamian kings to do so. A well-known image of Naram Sin from a large stela produced during his reign shows him striding heroically up a mountainside, weapons in hand, dead enemies underfoot, and horns on his helmet. Only gods wore horned helmets. It was a time of innovation in many ways. Not only did Sargon conceive of and build a vast empire, he also came up with ways to organize and control the territories he had conquered. He enriched the state and himself in various ways, and he and his successors promoted a spirit of experimentation among artisans and craftsmen. Objects found in archaeological contexts from the era of the Akkadian Empire are often eye-catching. Cylinder seals featured a wide range of subjects, carved with a skill and subtlety rarely matched in later Mesopotamian history. A copper head of a king of Akkad, it is unclear which one, is much more lifelike than early dynastic sculptures of kings, with their exaggerated features and huge staring eyes. The stela of Naram Sin conquering his enemies was the work of an innovative, though anonymous, artist who broke free of the usual register lines that had divided up early dynastic art into horizontal scenes. His figures climb the mountain and fall from it in organized abandon. But who was Sargon? Where did he come from? Given that the legend about the basket on a river is highly suspect, how did he administer his far-flung empire from day to day? Few originals of his inscriptions survive, and those only in fragments. There are no administrative documents dated to his reign, no letters to his governors or to foreign kings. We do not even have an image of him sculpted during his lifetime. When the site of Akkad is eventually found, perhaps much more will be learned about Sargon and this first dynasty of emperors. For now, they remain somewhat enigmatic. Sargon cast a long shadow over the centuries that followed, as kings from many lands tried to replicate his military successes. But, in a way, 
he is missing from his own portrait. A hero without a face or voice. The Akkadian Empire collapsed after the reign of the fourth successor to Sargon. Falling victim to internal rebellions and invasions of highland peoples from the Zagros Mountains, various kings then split the former empire among them, each having power over a limited area. One of these kings, Gudea, who ruled Lagash in the 22nd century BCE, continued Sargon's practice of importing luxury goods from Magan, Oman, and Dilmun, Bahrain. His face is familiar to visitors to the Louvre, the British Museum, the Metropolitan Museum, and several other museums because of the many diorite statues of himself that he dedicated to the gods, which are now in those museums' collections. But Gudea's kingdom was dwarfed in size and influence by that of the third dynasty of Ur, created by a king named Ur-Nama. Ur-Nama started his life as a subject of the king of Uruk, but around 2112 BCE, he seized power in Ur and united much of what is now Iraq under his rule. Though he did not manage to conquer as far to the north as Sargon had done, but rather than describing his conquests as violent affairs, he referred to liberating the lands from their former overlords. He presented himself as a king who had the welfare of his people uppermost in his thoughts. Urnama also was the first king known to have put laws in writing. The laws were probably originally inscribed on a stone stela, but all that survives of them are copies on three broken clay tablets. Unfortunately, only 37 of the laws appear on these tablet fragments. There must have been more. The prologue to the laws depicts Urnama as a kind, pious king, devoted to order and justice. It begins with the king's epithets Urnama, the mighty warrior, king of the city of Ur, king of the lands of Sumer and Akkad. Although he could not claim to have inherited the throne, the king referred to himself as Urnama son born of the goddess Ninsun, as though his mother had been a goddess. The patron god of Ur, Nana, also figured prominently in the prologue to the laws. The god Nana was said to have received the kingship of the city of Ur from the ancestral gods An and Enlil. The earthly kings of Ur were beholden to Nana, just as priestess Enheduanna had been two centuries earlier. Ur-Nama's conquests are mentioned only briefly in the prologue. At that time, by the might of Nana, my lord, I liberated, whatever territories were under the subjugation of Anshan. Instead, he emphasizes the ways in which he standardized weights and measures, including, I made the copper bariga measure and standardized it at sixty silas. Most importantly, he asserts that he protected the weak in society. I did not deliver the orphan to the rich. I did not deliver the widow to the mighty. I did not deliver the man with but one shekel to the man with one mina, sixty shekels. I eliminated enmity, violence, and cries for justice. I established justice in the land. Ziggurat Construction Ur-Nama also tried endearing himself to his new subjects and the gods by sponsoring extensive building projects across the kingdom. At least four cities, including Ur and Uruk, saw the construction of huge, solid-stepped towers, called ziggurats, dedicated to their local gods. These structures would each have taken hundreds, perhaps thousands of men to construct. According to one estimate, the ziggurat in Ur was built of approximately two million baked bricks and five million sun-dried bricks. It has been calculated from the administrative texts of the time that the manufacture and transport of the bricks for just the lower platform of the ziggurat required around 145,700 man-days of work, or 146 days for 1,000 men working together. The texts show that workers were divided into groups of 50, each with a foreman and five team leaders one for every ten men. Other workers wove ropes and collected bitumen, 
Others allocated the rations of barley for all the workers, while farmers grew, harvested, and processed the barley. Meanwhile, scribes recorded all the details. The era of the Third Dynasty of Ur saw an expansion in size and an increase in sophistication of the administrative hierarchies attached to the palaces and temples. Workers on all manner of programs were paid in rations, and officials recorded their names and the amounts they received on clay tablets that were later archived. Because clay tablets could not be added to or changed later, there was no way for scribes to create the equivalent of ledgers. When it came time to create monthly or yearly summaries, the scribes had to copy from dozens or even hundreds of daily account tablets and to add up all the man-hours, along with the totals of incoming and outgoing materials. They organized their annual reports by product, quality, or type of worker, an enormously complicated task. The Mesopotamians craved order in their lives and societies, and this administration was nothing if not orderly. Almost obsessively so, it might seem to modern eyes. Urnama sometimes chose to have himself depicted in artworks, like some of the early dynastic kings, with a basket of earth on his head, as though he not only planned and sponsored the construction projects, but even worked on the buildings himself. His public image was a far cry from the warlike mien of Akkadian kings such as Sargon or Naram-Sin. Standardizations Urnama and his son and successor, Shulgi, made other efforts to unite the land, perhaps recognizing that the people over whom they ruled still thought of themselves more as citizens of a particular city or town than as subjects of a larger kingdom. The prologue to the laws mentions the standardization of all kinds of weights and measures. The kings even standardized brick sizes. The ideal was that plots of land, taxes, and prices across the kingdom would be measured in the same ways and would not need to be converted in order for trade or taxation to take place. The kings were not, however, entirely successful in all aspects of this standardization. Their subjects resisted an attempt to make everyone use the same calendar, for example. Each city had traditionally used unique names for the months, and most of them hung on to these, rather than adopting the month names of the state calendar. The Legal System the laws themselves were, at least according to the prologue, designed to eliminate enmity, violence, and cries for justice. People would not take retribution into their own hands, but would depend upon the statewide legal system. In writing down the laws, these kings of Ur were not inventing that system. Contracts had existed for centuries, along with courts, judges, and a belief that witnesses and evidence were necessary in order for a just verdict to be determined. The laws that the kings of Ur promulgated were probably legal precedents, memory aids again, reflecting decisions that had previously been made by judges, which could help inform future decisions. Even the complete text of the laws, if we had it, certainly could not have covered all possible crimes and infractions. By writing them down, the kings were doing something similar to what they had done in the foundation inscriptions found in temples making a permanent record of something that had previously been ephemeral. The laws were all expressed conditionally. Rather than stating that some particular action was forbidden, each law started with the premise that the infraction might take place and specified an appropriate punishment. For example, a law against false testimony stated that if a man presents himself as a witness but is demonstrated to be a perjurer, he shall weigh and deliver fifteen shekels of silver. This was a considerable sum. Other sources show that one could purchase ten or more unskilled female slaves for that amount. Most punishments, though sometimes financially devastating, did not involve physical harm to the accused. Of the twenty-five laws for which a punishment is preserved in Ornama's collection, twenty, eighty percent, resulted in the imposition of a fine or other payment on the condemned man, and one resulted in a physical punishment, having one's mouth scoured with salt. The death penalty was imposed only in four cases, for homicide, rape of a virgin wife of another man, 
adultery by a married woman, and some other crime pertaining to lawlessness. The meaning of the law is unclear. No one was sent to prison as a penalty for committing a crime. Witnesses were crucial in the determination of a verdict. Everyone involved in a case had to be willing to swear an oath that he or she was telling the truth. These oaths were deadly serious. Lying under oath was something the gods despised, according to Mesopotamian belief, and the gods could be expected to punish the liar in a much harsher way than did the human judges. If someone was willing to swear an oath, that person's testimony was considered reliable. No one, it was thought, would be crazy enough to lie directly to the gods. One might assume that judges constituted the primary audience for these laws, that the laws provided practical guidance for actual court cases. That might have been the case, but there is little concrete evidence for it. In the centuries following the time of kings ur -Nama and Shulgi, laws continued to be disseminated, but no known court records refer specifically to their being consulted. The kings emphasized in the epilogues to their laws, broken, unfortunately, in the case of ur -Nama, that the laws were part of a program to make right and truth shine forth and to bring well-being to the lands of Sumer and Akkad. Perhaps this did not require that the laws be followed to the letter, only that their spirit be followed. As with many royal inscriptions, the law collections all concluded with curses against anyone in the future who might deface or destroy the work, anyone who does anything evil to it, who damages my work, who enters the treasure room, who alters its pedestal, who effaces this inscription and writes his own name in place of mine, or, because of this curse, induces an outsider to remove it. Over time, the curses got longer and more colorful. By the time of the laws of Hammurabi, more than 300 years after the reign of ur -Nama, the curses took up 264 lines of the text and included just about every possible horrible thing that might happen to a king. Each god was addressed individually and asked to create a special kind of terror for any future king who damaged Hammurabi's laws. Inanna, now called Ishtar, was to strike down his warriors, drench the earth with their blood, make a heap of the corpses of his soldiers upon the plain. And as for him, may she deliver him into the hand of his enemies, and may she lead him bound captive to the land of his enemy. The kings seem to have been increasingly concerned that their names and deeds not be forgotten. If the curses worked and the stelas survived, then collections of laws, like royal inscriptions, provided insurance against future oblivion. They were not wrong. Here we are still writing about and discussing them after all. Some of the kings of Ur even followed in the footsteps of Naram Sin of Akkad and presented themselves as gods rather than men to the point of commissioning temples for their own worship. This is not to say that ur -Nama and Shulgi were concerned only with their own enduring reputations and did not care about the welfare of their subjects. They seem to have been sincere in their desire for order in the land. They instituted various measures to protect people who might otherwise have been weak or discriminated against. The orphan, widow, and poor man with but one shekel of the prologue. They provided for the safety of roads and protected merchants. Taxation and Redistribution Most dramatically, at least as far as the written record of their era is concerned, they created a system of taxation and redistribution of resources across the kingdom that was remarkable for its complexity and, it seems, efficiency. Approximately 120,000 cuneiform tablets written during the Third Dynasty of Ur have been discovered and the vast majority of them record details of some component of the immense system created by the kings to process payments, offerings, and compensations. Many tablets of this kind were drawn up in a place called Puzrish Dagan, which was created apparently by King Shulgi as a clearinghouse for goods, taxes, and offerings that were coming into the state and going out to the provinces. At least 12,000 cuneiform records are known to have come from Puzrish Dagan, representing a period of approximately 40 years during the Third Dynasty of Ur, starting toward the end of the reign of Shulgi.
These documents were the direct successors of the rudimentary economic texts from the Uruk period. Now, though, a document of this kind included much more information. Nouns could now be qualified with adjectives. Also added were the names of the officials involved, other circumstances, and the date when the tablet was drawn up. By now the words were written in lines, rather than in boxes, which were read from left to right, and from top to bottom of the tablet, just as we do in English. Many of the signs represented phonetic sounds, though some still stood for whole words. A typical administrative tablet from Puzrish Dagan records some transactions concerning sheep and goats that were sacrificed to the gods. It begins with a list of the sheep and goats to be sacrificed, each one described as fattened and designated for a particular god or person. One fattened sheep for the gods Enlil Ninlil. One fattened sheep for the god Nana, nighttime. Four fattened sheep Enlil, Ninlil. One fattened big goat, Nana, dawn, when the king entered. Four fattened sheep, Lustration of Nintinuga, via Atu. One fattened sheep, one big goat, Shulgad, the man of, the land of. Zidachri, via Shu, Shulgi, Sukal, official. Next comes the name of the official in charge, Aradmu, requisitioner, then the circumstances of the sacrifice and the source of the animals. The first day having passed from the month in the city of Tumal, expended from the office of the official, En Dingirmu. The tablet is dated, month 8, year Huhnuri was destroyed, and it ends with a summary, total sheep, 13. A scribe employed at Puzrish Dagan would have understood all the implications of this tablet. He would have known to check with the requisitioner, Aradmu, about any concerns he might have had regarding the transaction. He would have recognized, based on the date, that the sheep and goats listed were for the main annual religious festival in the city of Tumal, and that N. Dingirmu was the usual official who provided them. He is named on all of the eleven preserved documents of this sort, written over an eight-year period. The scribe would have known where, in the complex of buildings at Puzrish Dagan, to find N. Dingirmu, and where to take the sheep, both to the gods and to the man named Shulgad, from the distant land of Zi Dahri. In fact, during the next few days after this document was written, Shulgad received sheep at least five more times. By the fifth day of the month, another foreigner had joined him, a man from the land of Harshi. The lands of both Harshi and Zidakhri were in Ilam, to the east, beyond the core of the Ur kingdom. These ambassadors were a long way from home, probably visiting Tumal on a diplomatic mission and staying for the festival. The tablets from Puzrish Dagan show that it was an unusual place. It might not have had the temples, palaces, and houses of a normal town. Instead, the heart of the city must have been dominated by a complex of buildings dedicated to the management of livestock, including stockyards and slaughterhouses. Each month, one of the provinces in the kingdom was responsible for sending in its taxes, so that wealth was always coming in from somewhere. These taxes were sometimes paid in silver, but more often in such goods as barley, flour, reeds, and timber. As much as 48% of the barley annually produced in the provinces had to be paid as taxes, which were sent to Puzrish Dagan and to other major towns. The richer provinces were responsible for supplying the state for more than one month. By spreading the collection of taxes out through the year, the kings assured themselves of regular supplies. The movement of goods was not just a one-way transaction, however. Some provinces took cattle or other livestock away from Puzrish Dagan, perhaps as repayment for expenses they had incurred on behalf of the state. The river port at Pusrish Dagan would have been the site of many boats being unloaded, vast quantities of raw materials, and animals being recorded by busy scribes. All these goods had to be directed to the right warehouses, and the records of their deliveries had to be filed in the right offices. But in the case of Pusrish Dagan, 
archaeologists have no real sense of the physical spaces in which all this activity took place, because the site has never been formally excavated. Unlike Akkad, this is not because its location is unknown. Puzrish Dagan is now known as Drehem, a tell 10 kilometers southeast of Nippur. Around 1910, documents from Puzrish Dagan began appearing on the antiquities market in vast quantities, presumably having been dug up by local people. They were purchased by major museums and private collectors, and are now spread out across the world. Only recently, with the creation of online projects such as the Cuneiform Digital Library Initiative, CDLI, and the database for Neo-Sumerian texts, BDTNS, has it been possible for scholars to begin to organize the documents and to reconstruct the archives that must originally have existed at Puzresh Dagan, as well as at other sites? Any individual tablet does not tell us much, but viewed in groups they are much more informative. One can trace the careers of individual officials, or examine the taxes paid by specific provinces in different years, or try to understand the principles that underlay the taxation system, or even look at the role of blind workers, or the responsibilities of messengers. Almost nothing this detailed has survived from any other ancient civilization. The End of the Third Dynasty of Ur Like all its precursors, the kingdom of the Third Dynasty of Ur came to an end and the Mesopotamian cities over which it had ruled reverted to their more usual state of local control. For many of the people alive at the time, the change to their daily lives would have been minimal. Different rulers gave their names to the years, and taxes stayed close to home rather than being sent on to Ur. But rulers and taxes still existed, as did the need to plant and harvest, maintain irrigation canals, and to work on labor projects when called upon. Modern historians often see the end of the Third Dynasty of Ur as a significant turning point, and they have come up with many explanations for the end of the kingdom of the Third Dynasty of Ur. Rebellions in some areas, invasions in others, expensive military campaigns against persistent enemies, pockets of poor harvests, climate change, possible displacement of the course of the Tigris, difficulties maintaining complex administrations, loss of taxes from the provinces. Any or all of these may have contributed to the end of the dynasty. The records are full of holes, so it is hard to say. But for the average person living in Ur, or in another city that had paid its taxes to Ur in the past, the end of the dynasty might not have immediately seemed to be terribly important. The third dynasty of Ur was followed by an era known as the Old Babylonian Period a time of large kingdoms, primarily ruled by kings who spoke Amorite, a Semitic language that seems to have had Western roots. Amorite means Western. Although some important changes took place under the Amorite kings, they also adopted many of the institutions that had developed in the time of the kings of Ur. The Ur kings had created a model of kingship that was emulated in later generations. Letters supposedly written by and to the kings of Ur were copied by generations of young scribes as part of their formal training. Like Ur Nama and Shulgi, some subsequent kings aimed to be loved instead of feared. 